Good evening, everyone. My name is Ron Fraser, and uh, during the day I'm a banker, and tonight I serve as the new chair of the Venture Forum. So uh, needless to say, we're thrilled to be in this fantastic building, uh, and very grateful that Becker was a willing to offer us this space and sponsor the event and sponsor the food and, and uh, really put this whole thing together. So thank you to uh, Dr. Nancy Crimmins and Debbie Fontaine. Uh, Got mess up, okay. yeah, okay. <laughs> Paulina Fontaine and Laurie Jones for really putting putting the backbones of this together. Um, if you're not familiar with the Venture Forum, the Venture Forum has been around for several decades, and I do see some familiar faces in here as well as some new faces. That's great. Uh, who is the Venture Forum? Well, we're a community. Uh, we're a membership organization. We, uh, we're here to help everyone grow and be part of what I consider the ecosystem that's rapidly growing in, in the Worcester uh, business and innovative market. And we are a volunteer organization and we're always looking for volunteers, people who have uh, new ideas, people who can uh, sponsor events as well as uh, be part of the membership committee, be part of the sponsorship committee. And uh, we have a lot of fun together, learning and growing and creating some excitement here in the city. Uh, the Venture Forum is a not-for-profit organization and uh, we sponsor technology and other entrepreneurial I ideas and attempt to create and foster an environment where people can feel like they have a place to go to get answers to questions as they uh, have ideas, business plans, and the ability to get to the next step. Sometimes it's a brand new, fresh idea an idea that nobody's ever thought of before, you think. Sometimes it's a more mature company that's looking for, for growth. They might be looking for contacts in legal, CPA uh, areas. So we're looking at an exciting time right now in Worcester in general and I think in the world. Uh, the entrepreneurial community is strong and thriving as evidenced by what's going on here at, at Becker, at Clark, at WPI and all of the other uh, related colleges. Today, I was um, impressed by a story that came into the news. I, you may have seen it as well. Has anyone ever heard of Elon Musk? <laughs> Elon Musk. So Elon Musk <laughs> decides that what a great idea to take a, um, a rocket and put it into space and take a car that he owns and put that into space with a SpaceX man in a SpaceX suit. I wonder what uh, Robert Goddard would be thinking about that concept at this point in time as the father of modern rocketry. Uh, it's going to be exciting to see what happens in Worcester, in the ecosystem that we have, as well as uh, the future of, really, technology, new companies, et cetera. So having said all that, I'm going to turn everything over to Debbie and Lori. Lori? I'm so excited to be here tonight. This is like two, a couple of my worlds converging. I actually am adjunct faculty here to teach business classes, and I am on the advisory board for the Unisocial Business Center. So when I happened to go to a venture forum meeting after being away for a couple years, Joe Vignali called me and said, would you like to get reinvolved in the program planning for the venture forum? I had been with them for at least five years. And I was so excited to be able to come back. And I said, where do you need me? He said, program planning. <laughs> I said, well, I think I'll take the one at Becker if that's where you need me. So here we are tonight. And we have four speakers on our panel. And what's going to happen the way we have it set up for the evening is that each one of the speakers will come up and give their presentation about their businesses. And then after that, it, we might take just a couple questions, but then what we'll do is we'll split our speakers up into different locations in these two rooms. And we'll, we're basically going to put them in the corner, and then you can go find them and ask them more specific questions or ask about how the social business, how what they do might relate to interest, business interests that you have. So what I'd like to do right now is to introduce uh, Deborah Pilato-Fontaine as she's the Executive Director of Global Initiatives here at the Unis Social Business Center, Becker College. And she also directs, um, or uh, sorry, teaches in the Women's Emergent Leadership Institute, which I actually 
was able to be a student in that institute here. And it was great. So I'd like to turn it over to Debbie. Welcome, everyone. I wanted to, of course, give you a special welcome to our Unisocial Business Center in this new location. We've only been open for a couple of weeks, so we're still trying to work out logistics. But I do invite you, before you leave, if you haven't already, to go up our grand staircase to see what it's like upstairs, where MassDigi is housed, our eSports room, our virtual reality uh, classrooms, and our Unisocial Business Center suite. So I hope a lot of you, either individually or again as a venture forum, will want to come back to this space for any entrepreneurial or ventures, social venture types of events. Uh, there are a lot of um, information uh, pieces out on the table near the food, so please feel free to take our new UNIS brochure, take some information that other panelists have brought as well. Uh, if you'd like more information or would like to come and talk with me at any time about collaborative ideas for coffee or lunch, there's a sign-up sheet. And we would just love to have you involved because we see the Unisocial Social Business Center, which is the only one in the country, as a gift to the greater Worcester community and beyond. It may be housed here, but it's a gift for all businesses, nonprofits, and individuals who have that entrepreneurial mindset. So we truly do want you to come and talk to us on how you would like to be involved. If you'd like to uh, be a guest speaker in any of our business classes, we would appreciate that as well. So we're so glad you're here. We have lots of food out there, so feel free. Uh, this is a small enough audience. We can make it a little casual. We don't mind you eating and drinking in here, so please feel free to go back for first or seconds or help yourself to any, any of the cookies for dessert. So you can see our panelists up on the slide, uh, and uh, they will introduce themselves as they come up. And we'll each talk for about maybe 12 to 15 minutes at the very most. And then, as Lori said, we'll have some time for conversation uh, afterwards. So I'm going to just talk a little bit about the Unisocial Business Center and what social business is. And this is our tagline, Solving Social Problems, Transforming Lives. And here are just a couple of the things uh, that we do here at the Unis Center. In a few minutes, I'll be giving you some concrete examples. But we really conduct uh, outreach to both businesses and nonprofits. And we want to develop partnerships uh, with um, nonprofits or uh, community organizations that really have a common vision and a concern for social change. And our position is that we align business principles with social objectives. So of course the social business, the focus or the emphasis I should say, is certainly more on social than business, although both are intertwined. And as Dr. Crimmin said, we're hoping the Barrett Center will be and is a exploration and innovation and leadership center. And we really, again, want to work with different partners in the community that share our vision, our goals, not only of the Unis Center, but of Becker College. The president before Dr. Kremen, Dr. Robert Johnson, seven years ago, brought with him a whole global vision. So we actually have a major in global citizenship for our students. Our vision, our mission, our core values, our graduation attribution statement, our curriculum is all around global citizenship. So this, of course, fits in nicely with our Yunus Center. Some of you, I'm sure, are familiar with Dr. Mohammed Yunus, who won the Nobel uh, Peace Prize in 2006, and the founder of Grameen Bank. Were any of you here uh, about a year and a half ago? Well, I think April of 2016, Virginia was when he spoke at Mechanics Hall, is our presidential speaker series. And uh, we're the only, as I said, the only Unis Social Business Center in the country, and we have regular dialogue and communication and visits with uh, Dr. Unis. So we've adopted uh, Dr. Unis's uh, definition and concept of social business. And Dr. Yunus said, um, 
he always refers to social business as a new kind of business model, a financially sustainable organization that identifies and then tries to solve community problems. Original investments are returned to the company, but all profits are reinvested to further that social impact and to create new value. And so it could be any organization, business, corporation that is a for-profit company, and at the same time, they have a social conscience. And that's what makes social business a little bit different from other types of business models. So in the social business company, measure or success is measured by, is the company reaching the desired social goals, whatever they happen to identify that social problem as. And for businesses that are committed to solving social issues, social business activities actually enhance traditional CSR, corporate social responsibility uh, models. And as you all know, CSR is usually the, the philanthropic part of the arm of the company, uh, you know, engaging in uh, making donations, participating in walks, participating in fundraisers. But in a social business, the social business is part of the company which is dedicated to social profit maximization. That's its primary goal. And here are just some of the more recent statistics um, that we've been researching here at the Eunice Center about engaging in social business and why that's important for both employers and our recent graduates because our recent graduates that have or who have a social conscious in the kind of companies that they, that they would like to work in. And just this afternoon, to go along with these statistics, uh, I don't know how many of you watched the Super Bowl commercials. I didn't get to see them uh, this time. But there was an article that just came out called Super Bowl Provides Cities a Lesson on Messaging for Millennials. And the first part of the article reads, only 6.4 of Super Bowl ads in the past 10 years made a corporate social responsibility appeal. According to research from Charles Taylor, a marketing professor at Villanova Business School. But he is projecting that there will be more cause-based ads this year because they are favored by millennials. So we're, this is the, the kind of traje uh, trajectory that we're seeing with our students here who have a social conscious, but also want to work in the business field in some way. And we know that employers are looking for graduates that have that desire to make a positive difference in the world to create that social impact. We've also developed a partnership criteria just to kind of keep us focused with our businesses and nonprofits, and that criteria is listed here. And just some examples of what we are doing here at the Unisocial Social Business Center. We have, we have many examples, but I'm just going to, in closing, run through a few of them. We are partnered with Accenture's uh, New Americans program. And if you saw on the table, we're hoping to have our event here if we're not snowed out, but we have a snow date for February 28th, where we're bringing in uh, refugee business owners, about 10 to 12 business owners, and they're going to come here and we're going to establish a networking group. We've invited business professors and students to work with them because they've, uh, we've done a survey of the business owners and they said that was their number one need, to, to network and to advance their businesses. And so we're going to help them here at Becker with some advertising and web development and that kind of thing. So we invite you to take that flyer um, and either come tomorrow evening, but most likely our snow day of February 28th. So we're excited about that. And that's really been the goal of the Unisocial Business Center so far in the community. Our first priority is to our students here, but we've been working very um, heavily in the refugee and immigrant community. We also do a lot of work in Haiti. If you've heard of the Be Like Brit Foundation or the Be Like Brit Orphanage, 
where we offer a curriculum in, in rural social entrepreneurship. We provide a training for all the caregivers and staff uh, to increase their employability skills. And we also last year set up a new education certificate program for the staff. We had a first cohort of 12 graduates, and this year we more than doubled our second cohort with another uh, graduation in May of this year. One of our students, uh, you see the chairs in the background, Ashley Raquel Knight, who's sitting right be behind Lori, is a senior in global citizenship here. And she identified a social problem in her homeland of Jamaica, needing more chairs in classrooms because so many children in the rural parts of, of, of Jamaica were being sent home because there were simply no chairs for them to sit on to do their schoolwork. So she established an organization, a company called One Chair for One Child. So you might want to also speak with her a little bit later. She's joining us this evening. We've, uh, we've done work with refugee artisans of Worcester where a professor uh, in, in our social business class worked with his students and refugee artists to develop business plans and to help promote their artwork in the community. And you see the picture of Paul Wa. We work uh, with Worcester Refugee Assistance Project. And we have another business professor who is helping Paul Wa to form her own catering business called Burmese Noodles, because she's a wonderful cook. And her dream is to become a caterer. We have a change maker program here for students where they can work on different um, uh, ideas for innovation to make a difference in the world. And again, we have professors and people like Joe Vignali, who's a member of our uh, UNIS advisory board, uh, mentoring our students. We're working with uh, Worcester Roots and the Social Venture Collaborative in the co-hosting of Matt's Co-op Academy that you'll hear about in a few minutes, and just all kinds of other uh, things that we're working on as well. So I know this is just a very quick overview, but as I said, I invite you to take my card and either speak with me after tonight's program, or certainly you're welcome anytime to uh, be with us and, and talk about more ideas. Thanks so much. So I'm, uh, my name is Michael Alden, and I am from an organization called Language Bank. And I'm just going to talk really quickly about um, the problem that it solves and the future growth um, of the social enterprise. Uh, but to start off um, with uh, what Language Bank is, I'll introduce it through a story. Um, there was a, a gentleman who was about 15 years old, and his name was Willie Ramirez. And um, a few decades ago, he went into a South Florida hospital with his family. He was uh, Spanish-speaking. Uh, boy, and um, he wasn't feeling well, and his sister, uh, on his behalf, uh, told the, the physician um, that uh, she used the word intoxicado to describe uh, how he was feeling. Um, I personally uh, avoided taking foreign languages in high school as an aside, and now I'm involved with a language interpretation business, which is uh, God's fancy way of, of paying us back. But um, does anybody here know uh, or want to venture a guess as to what the word intoxicado means? It's just Spanish. I mean, what it tries to mean intoxicated, but it's not really a word. Yeah. So uh, how many thought, okay, I'm intoxicated, you know, if you were a doctor and, you, yeah. <coughs> Same here. So um, the... Willie, who was described by his sister as intoxicado, uh, was treated as if he was intoxicated. Um, but unfortunately, he had a hemorrhage. And so um, because of that hemorrhage, he, uh, it was misdiagnosed, and he became a quadriplegic. Uh, and so uh, when I first got involved with Language Bank a few years ago, you know, I said, OK, this is a case study. I feel for uh, this family and this individual. But unfortunately, this happens a lot. Um, I mentioned I, I never took a foreign language in high school. I weaseled my way out of it. And, and now I work for uh, Language Bank. Language Bank is a social enterprise. We have a social mission of empowering people with limited English proficiency. And we do that through providing professionally trained language interpreters many of whom are refugees uh, and new Americans, uh, likewise, from uh, the countries of origin. 
And so um, if the limited English proficient population of the US, if this was the United States, there would be three people in this room um, who, ha who would have limited English proficiency and would be in a very similar case to um, Willie Ramirez, uh, who unfortunately um, became a quadriplegic, uh, quadriplegic because uh, there was not a properly trained medical interpreter. So um, our solution, again, I'm just going to speak briefly about uh, the problem, the solution, and uh, the impact. So uh, we have a fee-for-service social enterprise. So our customers are hospitals, uh, courts, schools, for-profit businesses, et cetera. Uh, we have a profit margin uh, without any uh, government support. Uh, so we're a self-sustaining uh, organization. Um, we do about, I want to say, 40,000 plus uh, appointments a year. Um, so uh, we're, we're constantly busy, and we offer 60 languages of service. So. Um, Recently, the city of Worcester called us, and um, they said, do you have people that speak this language? And I was walking around in one of our offices, and I asked, you know, what's this language, Kaba, Sango? And uh, the case manager that was near me said, oh, yeah, right here. The person happened to be there, and it happened to be one of two people in the entire uh, metropolitan area that spoke that language. So uh, we have, a, uh, I guess, a special sauce of language and culture. Our customers value that. Um, they tell us that they like that we're not just a 1-800 commodity, that we really understand the culture and, and the needs of their, if it's a hospital, patients, if it's a court, they're doing des depositions, they understand um, you know, th their clients. So that's, that's our solution. Um, our annual impact and scale, um, so, uh, it's multifaceted. We, as I mentioned, we employ refugees as many of our language interpreters. And so uh, the uh, wage that we pay them, the sort of market rate for a language interpreter, is a multiple of their uh, comparable employment. And um, the definition of social impact is, uh, are you making a, a difference that is uh, uh, in a quantity basis more than or from a quality basis better than um, what the best uh, sort of uh, alternative is. And so in this case, yes, uh, we pay our employees a wage that's higher than they otherwise would earn. Um, and then uh, likewise, indirectly, we generate um, uh, increased revenue um, to the government through the higher uh, individual federal income tax uh, uh, that, that's generated through the services. Um, the other aspect of our annual impact, um, we enable organizations to reach, uh, as I mentioned, uh, limited English proficient populations uh, and to serve new people and to grow. Um, I will say that your comment about the Super Bowl ads, I was watching them and it sort of uh, struck me this year compared to past years, there seems to be a, a real uh, increased target towards uh, millennials uh, who value things like uh, globalism and, and, and modernity and uh, progressiveness. Uh, but, but we allow businesses to serve uh, people that otherwise they can't serve. And so through that, uh, we have an impact. And our scale of that impact, as I mentioned, we do 40,000 appointments annually in over 60 languages. Um, and uh, I guess lastly, as far as impact, because we're structured as a social enterprise, um, we, we serve uh, an underserved population, limited English proficient people, and we employ refugees, um, another uh, traditionally underserved population. And uh, we generate um, hundreds of thousands of dollars of uh, net profit every year that we can then use to offset the limited and shrinking um, government assistance for services for new Americans like refugee resettlement, uh, which is in plain speak picking up new Americans at the airport, um, providing them with uh, their first new home when they arrive in the United States, uh, providing uh, language assistance, uh, employment placement, um, and, and legal assistance. And so the, the proceeds that we generate uh, enable us to more effectively provide services for new Americans. So it's a, a nice um, in my opinion, at least, win-win-win. So um, future growth 
in, in summary, um, there are more people arriving to the United States with limited English proficiency uh, than in the past. And uh, the studies that we've looked at of uh, immigration trends uh, imply that this will continue. Um, now, uh, refugee uh, new arrivals, that's uh, determined uh, by the government and that can vary year to year, but refugee new arrivals are only a small uh, drop of, of what are uh, other forms uh, where foreign born people come to the United States um, and, and stay permanently. So um, there are in the pipeline over 65 million new American, or excuse me, people of concern worldwide uh, who will then become uh, asylum seekers, refugees, um, and, and people seeking um, uh, a home. And the U.S. traditionally is uh, the country that resettles the largest number of uh, new Americans. And um, there's a correlation at um, the top of that slide between English proficiency and foreign born status, particularly people who are forcibly displaced. Future growth uh, for our organization, we currently provide language interpreters to hospitals. Um, and um, the industry uh, is experiencing um, uh, uh, forces that, that are uh, tied to the commodity. It's becoming a commodity. Uh, customers think of, you know what, this is expensive. I need to have this sort of bridge to patch, um, to to patch the service. And so, um, like any company that's uh, finding its space encroached upon by the likes of Amazon and, and other sort of supply demand matching platforms, um, we have chosen to take an approach of uh, pivoting to a high-touch uh, service, and particularly and interestingly, um, in the city of Worcester, where uh, we have a strong healthcare economy, um, there is a, a large push to incorporate the social determinants of health into care delivery. Um, it's uh, becoming more obvious that compared to other countries, the United States spends a proportionately a smaller share on uh, human services uh, than traditional healthcare delivery, and um, that the causes of a lot of health conditions are uh, social and behavioral. And so um, we believe that we're uniquely positioned uh, to reduce um, the operating costs of some of our healthcare customers by specifically targeting, lowering the cost of care uh, through uh, the timeliness of care, tardy appointments, missed appointments, canceled appointments, um, the treatment plan follow through, uh, the uh, duration of appointments, uh, surgical delays, unnecessary ER visits, and um, uh, treatment plan follow through. And so uh, we are in the process of pivoting our existing service offering to be more high touch and to really emphasize that sort of special sauce that our customers told us and continue to tell us about that we offer a superior um, high quality solution. Um, so that's Language Bank. Uh, it's a social enterprise. It uh, has a social mission. It empowers limited English proficient people through the provision of professional language interpretation. Um, it has a, a large impact on a, a dollar basis as well as um, on uh, social uh, metrics that we follow and track. And we believe, uh, given the current state of healthcare as well as the projected trends for new American arrivals with limited English proficiency, that we are poised for future growth. Um, and so happy to talk about, uh, when we go to the panel session, any questions that you might have. But that's Language Bank. Thanks. So I'm going to be speaking about a specific kind of social enterprise um, cooperatives and what's happening here in Worcester. Starting with my own kind of roots and inspiration from this work, uh, I see a lot, uh, these three concepts coming up a lot in, in my life and in my work around adaptation, around creation, and around coalition. So just like these seeds that are from uh, a tree that, that grows in the desert and is adapted to, you put a, a drop of water on these seeds, within seconds you see roots grow. So it can cling on to the, to the riverbed. And that kind of adaptation um, that we see in nature is, is also important in, in our lives and in entrepreneurship, right? So I, you know, in my own life, kind of navigating, um, coming from a multi-heritage you know, um, kind of situation with my 
my dad's uh, Jewish side being uh, pro-union, teaching me how to check for the union bug on everything, and my mom's more conservative side, you know, being quite anti-union. So navigating that, that kind of adaptation in my own life, I've seen, uh, you know, become useful in entrepreneurship. And at, and at 12, in terms of creation, I, I uh, started my, my first business with some friends making devil sticks, also called flower sticks, or um, these juggling sticks, right? We were, we were 12 years old. We, um, we made these, we each made $250 you know, that wasn't bad for a 12-year-old in the, in the 90s, right? Um, and that uh, was the first cooperative I was involved in. Didn't know it at the time. And then Coalition, I was really inspired to see what happened in, in Argentina with the, the economic collapse and a lot of companies closing down. Um, the workers banded together in, in Coalition and kept their jobs running in the shells of Adidas factories and elsewhere that were, were shutting down. Um, so that kind of coalition was, was very instrumental in, um, in shaping my uh, path for, uh, with cooperatives. So a quick step back, what is a cooperative? Uh, a, joint, a jointly owned enterprise um, that's owned by the members. The members could be the workers, um, like Cooperative Home Care um, Associates in New York City that's owned by over 2,000 mostly uh, immigrant women um, in in uh, doing home health care. Uh, equal exchange, the, the folks who bring up fair trade coffee and, and, uh, and do the processing and marketing of coffee and other uh, fair trade goods. Um, or it could be the consumers. People might be familiar with food cooperatives um, uh, or hardware stores or credit unions. Um, or uh, cooperatives could be owned by businesses. You see that a lot in agricultural sectors. Uh, we focus on worker cooperatives in our work here with Worcester Roots. Um, but it's important that democracy, you see democracy within the, the enterprise, um, and they have the potential to build wealth. So uh, there's the, a, a reinvestment mechanism within cooperatives, but also the ability for each entrepreneur to, to build wealth. Uh, and there's a resiliency, this, this, this theme of, um, of adaptation again, for example, uh, the largest network of cooperatives, Mondragon in Spain, during the 2008 downturn, was able to shift around and adapt and not lay off any workers. Um, they have uh, over 2,000 um, different uh, cooperative entities that they, that they um, could shift people around in. They were able to um, do retraining and, and really adapt when other people, other companies in that manufacturing kind of arena were hit hard in Europe. And it is, like I said, a form of social enterprise that, that takes a, a governance structure where it's owned by the members. Um, and you also see um, care for community and sustainability as core principles in cooperatives. So here in Worcester, we have um, Stone Soup Community Center in Maine South. That's kind of a hub of a lot of the, the co-op activity um, and where our offices, Worcester Roots, uh, where we're, we're focused. And one of the first projects we were involved in was the Toxic Soil Busters that did soil remediation. And now the youth um, from that initiative are doing uh, a store called Co-op Connections where they're selling co cooperatively produced goods um, at events and raising awareness. Uh, there's Future Focus Media that Dee will be talking more about. So these are some of the initial co-ops that we've been working with. Diggers Landscaping Cooperative, uh, Access Co-op, Danya is one of the member owners. It's, it's owned by uh, indigenous immigrant women. Um, they do language, justice, uh, education, interpreting, translation. Uh, and I want to, to say a few words about aquaponics, the uh, green vitalized urban growers because it's, it's really a good example of how we have this social innovation, right? An issue around um, access to food and food distribution and knowledge about food. And, and, um, and these innovators are tackling the issue through an enterprise, uh, starting with greenhouses and urban and uh, indoor urban growing, right? Uh, aquaponic systems, hydroponic systems, where, where the fish, uh, it's a closed loop system with, with plants and fish. 
Um, and so it's, it's really exciting part of my job is to work with these innovators to tackle a community problem and finding a way you know, through enterprise to, to meet those needs and to make it sustainable. Intersection Cafe, for example, is wanting to do a community center and, and community space and will run a cafe out of it. Wu Rides, we have Ali and Shabazz here in the house that are uh, really at the forefront of a lot of this, thinking about sustainable transportation and really have, uh, are poised to, to do some big stuff here in Worcester. Works Printing Cooperative um, does uh, directed textile printing. So think of a, a color you know, printer on paper. They can do it on textiles, mugs, and they, they, um, they're growing really fast here in Worcester as well. Um, and really you know, bringing fairly traded uh, and fairly produced goods into, the, uh, into that setting of textiles. Worcester Bookkeeping Cooperative is a, a conversion from a, a one person who wanted to grow it. Um, so is Three Cross Brewing. They recently uh, converted to a, a cooperative. They're down on Cambridge Street. Um, and so we are, we're seeing more and more interest in converting existing companies into cooperatives, uh, which can be either a growth strategy, the owner wants to stay in and grow um, and needs more equity or wants to, to share the responsibilities in different ways. Um, so uh, that's one way, but also for secession planning. Um, there are tax incentives, there, there's way of, of keeping the, the, the company's culture through selling to employees and, and forming them as cooperatives. Um, there are several uh, examples of that um, up and down the East Coast and, and elsewhere. Uh, Neuron Robotics is another cooperative. So we see Drop It Like It's Hot Sauce as a youth led um, initiative growing food and, and learning about co-op business and creating their own hot sauce and selling it. So we finally have enough of these cooperative enterprises where we've come together in coalition. Uh, and so we, we formed a group called Cooperation Worcester and we're uh, active in the social venture collaborative uh, that put on the New Economy Summit and, um, and then nationally and internationally, we're involved in, in other networks, the U United States Solidarity Economy Network, New Economy Coalition, and a, a National Federation of Worker Cooperatives. So these coalitions are really key for us to, to kind of grow our, our impact. Um, and, but it's really this on the ground training that we do each year, starting in 2013, um, our Co-op Academy. Uh, people come with an idea, maybe already doing a little bit of business in, in an enterprise and get full uh, training. Um, we do a, a 10 to 12 week intensive training on different things, including how to, to really run your cooperative and deal with conflict that comes up and things like that. So we've, we've done an annual uh, co-op academy. Um, and this is our latest cohort. Um, and this year we're excited to partner uh, with Becker and the Unis Center and Global Initiatives here um, for to, to do the academy here. So um, encourage any of you that know entrepreneurs that might be interested in this model to check it out. WorcesterRoots.org has all the info. People can already set, sign up if they're interested. Um, and just to go in really quickly into a few challenges and strategies we see. So we've helped start a lot of these co-ops or just they've come through our, our academy and then we connect them with the network. But really what we see a lot of them need is access to a stable market. So one of our strategies around that is to, um, to really uh, move towards purchase agreements with hospitals, universities, other anchors. Um, but there's, it's, it's quite a process to get um, the understanding and the, the companies ready for those kind of purchase agreements. But that's a, a longer term project we have going. And then awareness about cooperatives. So we do a lot of events, the academies, videos. Um, and then um, systemic oppression and a mindset that's really about us as an individual or um, you know, a very specific kind of mindset that's been uh, ingrained in us is actually a, a quite a challenge for us to be able to do effective cooperatives. So to, to get at that, we um, are looking to do more and more uh, popular education using theater, using the knowledge that's in the room, not having one you know, educator at the front of the room, but really you know, using the, uh, the experience of people to, to learn through and, and out of some of those traps. Um, so uh, 
you know, as we bring together, as we adapt, we see that co-ops are really adaptive and they can, um, uh, they are 30% more likely to, to be around in five years than another enterprise um, because there's community buy-in, right? There's real membership buy-in. Um, we see real creativity going on um, and we see them coming together now in Worcester in, in strong coalitions. Good evening. We still awake? Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. I'll, I'll begin because I'm, I'm West Indian, so there's a call and response kind of thing. I grew up in the U.S. Virgin Islands, so I have to acknowledge and you have to respond. So I will do that throughout my presentation. So uh, my name is Dee Wells. I'm originally from uh, the U.S. Virgin Islands. Uh, I grew up on the uh, beautiful island of St. John commuted every day by boat. Some of you commuted by bus. I took a boat every morning and had a 20 minute opportunity to either nap, cram more studying, catch up with my friends, talk sports, or take pictures. And it's, it's not funny that I stand here this evening uh, talking about just that, our business, uh, that Matt mentioned it very, very quickly that he's also one of the co-founders of Future Focus Media, which is a worker-owner cooperative business uh, here in Worcester. But we also teach. We, we're, we're set up a little different. And that was all done on purpose, because one of the things that I had the beauty or the, I had the blessing to receive was my father, who was in the Navy, put a camera in my hand when I was very, very young. And his love of photography you know, was, was kind of catapulted or, or cast on me. And one of the things that we all do as human beings, and we may not think of ourselves as such, we're all storytellers. That's all we do. I grew up a around a lot of women. I grew up a lot of, around a lot of older women. It was, uh, you sat, you listened, you learned, I learned, and that knowledge came about that way. And then, fast forward with you know, film photography, with camcorders and things like that, capturing those stories and telling them and sharing them. If you sit for a quick second, think about the best movie or documentary or TV show, we're not gonna talk about the Super Bowl, <laughs> that you may have just recently seen and the impact it made on you the story that it, it left you with. Maybe it made you cry, right? I think of some of the best commercials that were broadcast during the Super Bowl. One of them that really struck me was about, anyone remember the skier, the paraplegic? Remember those, right? Not giving up, no excuses. When you get tired, what? keep going, perseverance. That's what we are as human beings. We talk about that. So that's what we do in our business at Future Focus, is we take our skills, some of them are God-given, some of them are developed, certainly, and then we teach those skills really hands-on to youth here in the city of Worcester. We teach them photography, we teach them filmmaking, we teach them the editing, all the different software programs that, that Debbie and, and Lori mentioned earlier that are applied right here in this building, be it uh, artificial intelligence, be it uh, computer technology using programs like Photoshop, like uh, Adobe Premiere, like Final Cut. We're storytellers. That's what we are as human beings. And that's one of the hardest things to do is how to merge those two things as a storyteller and an entrepreneur. In this day and age, if you're not thinking about having a side hustle, and I use that on purpose, I use that word on purpose, side hustle, if you're putting all your eggs in one basket, what happens? Your basket ends up being empty. Your soul probably isn't full, right? So you should have something. You should have something that you do, something that you love to do. But more importantly, it's all about storytelling. So that's what we do. We teach youth hands-on how to tell a compelling story and how to let their vision be seen. Nowadays, because of these supercomputers that are very, very small, we all have the ability to do just that. We have this thing called social media. You notice the word, what's first? Social. Why? Because we communicate. 
That's what we're born to do. We forget to do that, though. That's one of the things that we forget to do with social media. We think it's just a one-way thing. How many of you use Twitter? Be honest. Yep. How, how many of you would say you're very good at tweeting? One, two, no? I see a lot of head shaking. How about Instagram? How many of you use Instagram? Okay, good. What's the most important thing that you learned about, I'm gonna call you out, so please say your name. What's the most important thing about Instagram that you've learned probably within the past uh, week to a month? Uh, my name's Tim. Um, I would say uh, using the direct messaging more effectively mm. on Instagram. You're sliding in DMs, it's yeah. Not, yeah, yeah, well it's not, when you open up the app, it's not apparent, right? You're meant to scroll through your feed, you're meant to take a picture. Um, it's not as in your face on some of the other social media apps that there is that messaging component there. Absolutely. The most important thing there, Tim, correct? Yes. Is connecting with other human beings. Connecting directly by going to their direct message and saying, hey, I like your picture. I like your story. I like your video. I'd like to collaborate with you. We should work together, which is amazing tool that we have. With this new technology, and, and bear with me, I always think about it this way. If I could teach my mother how to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, then we have no excuse not to use it. These are all tools to tell our story. Again, how do we tell our story? How do we use these tools to do just that? Speaking with youth, talking with millennials, speaking with even younger, this past summer, we, we had a cohort of youth that produced a, a short film, mini documentary, about the ever-changing face of Worcester, the gentrification of Worcester. From the perspective of a young man who's a student athlete at the University of Connecticut, and one of our youngest uh, producers, as we like to call them, youth media specialists, uh, was 12 years old. And from that, from that experience, he has launched his own YouTube channel. He loves theater, he loves acting, he loves comedy, and he loves technology. So a spark from spending three weeks with us, actually, I, I stand corrected, six weeks with us, sparked something within him to tell his story, continue developing his story. That's one of the hardest things to do, to be honest, to put yourself out there, because no one wants to look stupid, uncool, right? But guess what? We all are. We all are. Some people say, well, D, you're crazy. I said, yep, we just all have different levels of crazy. I just have West Indian crazy in me, so that's, uh, you know, me gone, me gone, me gone, me gone, so. <laughs> but the most important thing is to realize that our impact, our impact on each other is profound. As entrepreneurs, what is our legacy, right? What, what are you leaving behind? You can't take it with you. My grandmother lived to be 95 years old, and she used to always say when I would complain about being tired, she said, you can sleep when you're dead. I was like, okay, Grandma, I understand what you're seeing here. I get it, right? You can sleep when you're dead. How do we impact each other? What do we do? What is our legacy? We can't take it with us, but what we can leave behind can be pictures, video. How many authors are in this room at this moment? How many of you have published a book? Amazing. Thank you. You're leaving a legacy behind. How many of you have produced a documentary or a movie? Don't be shy. There you go. How many of you are writing a book at this exact moment? Yes. Good. Have any of you thought of turning your camera, your cell phone, camcorder on yourself and sharing your story of some of your fears, some of your highlights, so that your children, grandchildren, future generation can see you? Have you thought about doing that? I strongly encourage you to do it. I have a 17-year-old daughter who's a senior in high school, some huge milestone she's going to hit this year. She's going to turn 18, she's going to graduate from high school, and she's going to attend American University in the fall. 
I have documented her entire life. I have documented her entire life, which is amazing to think. Whenever she asked for an old school picture of her when she was three years old, guess what? I could go right into a couple hard drives and pull it all up. That first video of her walking, I got it on tape, mini DV tape at that, right? So what is your legacy? What are you documenting? What's the story you're telling? As an entrepreneur, one of the things we are very, very good at doing is showing the great, the highlights, the, the, the defining moments. But guess what? Do we ever share the stories where we've failed or failed fast, rebuilt ourselves back up? Not very often, because guess what? That's not cool. That's not cool. But we learn, as human beings, we learn more from those failed, you know, failed launches, if you want to call them. Because then we get to say, hey, what did I do really, really good there? Who did I not collaborate with? Did I have all the information? What can, I re what can be done differently? So as part of a, being an entrepreneur, I really always encourage people to try different things. I've worked in higher education. I started a mortgage bank. I've sold insurance. I've had multiple careers. I've had multiple vocations. But those don't define me. They don't even define any of you sitting here this evening. As you're thinking about maybe your next venture, maybe you're thinking about your business, which isn't doing very, very good right now, and you're thinking about transitioning, how are you going to do that? Is your ego getting in your own way? Is the person you're looking at in the mirror looking back at you and saying, man, I'm scared. That's okay. It's okay to be scared. That means you're alive. That means you have something to fight harder for, something to work towards. So I really implore you to turn the camera from time to time. Don't be afraid. You know, um, Cece is her name. She's very good at selfies. So I do selfies now because we document everything. So I will close with this. We are going to take a selfie. So I'm going to need everyone to stand up. Please, everyone stand up. Because we're going to document this moment in time. Because maybe, just maybe, through these conversations tonight, it is going to implore you, encourage you, instill, or drive you to do something a little bit different and get out of your own way. OK? Cool? Yes. Cool? Yes. All right. I love call and response. I told you. So let's do it like this. <laughs>